Neil Sloan from the OIS Foundation and Aspen University to, spoke, to speak about actual number theory sequences among others of Pablo Picasso. Thank you, Dr. Um, so, if I can press that? No. Can I press that? No. Uh, Maybe you have to switch it on? Which button is it? I don't. I, I was doing this from the. This function is not available. Yeah. Yeah, that's. At the start, I was just doing it. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to talk about um, some lovely new sequences, almost all unsolved, that are um, recent acquisitions in the OAIS. And. Uh, before that, I want to mention three recent news items from the OAIS. And so if I do that, yes. So the three items are, there's a new poster, a new postcard. We have a prize of $1,000 for the uh, best contribution to the OAIS in this year. And there's a new sequence from Pablo Picasso that my brother just discovered at Barcelona. <laughs> So the postcard, which you can pick up, there's a pile of them over there. This is what the postcard looks like. And it's based on our new poster. And um, I chose nine sequences that had interesting pictures. Um, and mostly unsolved problems. So for instance, the one at the top right asks for what's the maximum number of pieces you can make if you take a convex polygon with, say, seven sides and draw all the diagonals, you get a certain number of pieces of pizza. What's the maximum number of pieces you can get? And this shows the answer for um, a seven gone, and you can get 47. You want to minimize, sorry, you want to minimize the number of pieces. The answer is 47, if it's a 7 column. And the answers are only known for um, polygons of sides 3 through 8. The middle one is the Peaceable Queens sequence, which is you play it on a board, an n by n chessboard, and you want to put down black queens and white queens, equal numbers of each. And these are Peaceable Queens, and they don't want to attack each other. You want to maximize the number. So on a chessboard, an ordinary 8 by 8 chessboard, you can put down nine black queens and nine white queens in such a way that they don't attack each other. This is for um, three, six, this is for an 11 by 11 board, and the answer is 17 queens, as you can see, carefully arranged. This was a sequence that was contributed originally by Don Knuth, and it's been uh, extended by several people, and we now have the answers up. We know the exact answers for 13, up through 13. Is the heart of the head of the famous non attacking queen? Or Not no? really, no. Um, it's, well, it's, it's about ball. queens on a chessboard, yeah. but it's a different kind of game because here you have black queens and white queens, yeah. two kinds. Which oh, they're going to attack each other. But they, of course. Yes, they can attack. Yes, of course. And it's not us. They collaborate. Yeah. And um, this is the circles problem. How many ways can you draw n circles in the affine plane? So with three circles, they could be disjoint, they could be nested, and so on. And the rules are that you don't allow tangential contacts, and you don't allow three circles through a point. So this point actually, it appears to be an intersection. A triple intersection actually is a, there's a little bit of space there. So with three circles, there are 14 solutions. And with four circles, I thought we knew the answer. Jonathan Wilde at McGill had worked out the answer for four circles. But um, he wrote to me recently and said that it looks like there was a mistake, and the new number is such and such, but it hasn't been confirmed. Um, this one is Fredkin's replicator, which I talked about earlier this year in this seminar, and that's solved. 
This one down at the bottom right corner, I have an enlargement of, on the next slide, and I will just skip to that. But they're all interesting. This, this one, um, these are corners. This was found on a Tibetan, on the menu of a Tibetan restaurant in Lisbon, and generalized, as one does. The bottom, Oh, well, that's right, because it's a change I made to the talk. The, uh, the next slide, which you can't actually see, is a blow-up of this, which looks just fantastic. If you go to the OEIS and look up sequence number um, 229037, you will see the picture. It's a, it looks like a cloud of smoke, a forest fire, and we don't know why. It's um, a greedy sequence avoiding three terms in arithmetic progressions. So the second OEIS item is that we've established a prize, we did a, at the beginning of this year, of $1,000 for the best contribution to the OEIS, meaning the best solution to an unsolved problem or finding a formula or something like that. And if you look in the OEIS, you'll find about 10,000 entries that say, it would be nice to have a proof of this, or I wish we could get this sequence in a different way, or empirically it appears that. I've been trying to encourage contributors to be rigorous about this. If they have a formula, if it seems obvious that every number appears in the sequence, or that every prime eventually appears, if it seems obvious, but they don't have a proof, they have to say, empirically, or it appears that, or we conjecture. And there are a lot of sequences where it says that. And so this is all material. If you would like to uh, win the $1,000 prize, the deadline is December 1st. There's a web page about it on the uh, wiki. And uh, the idea of doing this was to encourage people to add to proofs to the OEIS encouraged by this money. So I want to step forward on this. Yeah, there's the picture of the smoke, but you can look that up. Okay, now we come to uh, the new sequence. My brother uh, was in Barcelona, and he was looking, uh, wandering around the Picasso Museum in Barcelona, and he noticed um, a poem. There was a time when Picasso was writing poems rather than painting. And this is the, the, the item, the exhibit. It's on the wall. It's one page. It has three copies um, of something. It's very hard to read there. I think it's probably just as hard to read in the original. My brother took some uh, photographs, and this is an enlargement of the top. And you can see the sequence. The sequence appears three times in the poem, and it goes 3, 4, 5, 10, 29, 0, 10, 0, 2, 2, 4, and so on. Um, and uh, so there it is. And the poem has a title, in, which in French is that, and in English is um, mathem Mathematically Pure illusionary, Illusory Image of Sickening Snoring, and then you can read the rest of it in the text. And it's not very pleasant reading. It, it seems to be surrealist nonsense. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any obvious connection with the sequence itself. So, uh, do you have a, an explanation? Uh, no, I was just saying that the little bit of French actually seems a more pleasant poem than the... <laughs> than the body of the work, yes, I agree. But, um, and then you, you, you may wonder what my brother... Um, <laughs> Um, oh yes, so, so by, purely by accident, the next week, the, the, my brother found this at the beginning of September. So the next week, um, I was reading an amusing book called American Literary Anecdotes, and uh, under Gertrude Stein, it has this story that um, once public, Picasso brought her some of his poetry to read. I read his poem, she later recalled, and then I seized him by both shoulders and shook him good and hard. Pablo, I said, go home and paint. <laughs> Which I think is the right reaction to that. Unfortunately, but it is a sequence. Um, published, at least. Uh, 
Now you may wonder what my brother was doing in Barcelona, and the reason is that although he lives in California, he recently bought a house in France, um, a rather large house. So uh, here it is. I feel uh, since he's my younger brother, I'm entitled to show off his oh, his, his new chateau. Oh, if it's so well off, why can you donate to Zoya? Yes, no. <laughs> I've never asked him. <laughs> Um, all right, so the, the main part of this talk is about some new sequences that have been sent into the OAIS, real sequences, recently. And so these are pretty nice. I think that any of the, the great classical number theorists would have um, appreciated these. These are a low-hanging fruit from uh, recent submissions. But at the end, I'm going to say that we need more editors to process the incoming sequences, and you get to see lots of nice stuff as they come in. So, um, you may not be familiar with the number 999990000, but it has a very interesting property, and it's a sequence that was sent in by Max Alexeyev um, in August of this year, and it appears to be the largest number with the following property. It's the largest number which is divisible by the ceiling of the square root of n. It's the largest n which is divisible by the ceiling of the square root of n, the ceiling of the cube root of n, the ceiling of the fourth root of n, the fifth root of n, and so on. For all k, it's divisible by the ceiling of the kth root of n, for all, all k. And it appears that there are only finitely many numbers with that property, the largest of which is that number. And it's been checked up to, I think Max checked it up to 10 to the 16. But it's only a conjecture that there are no more terms. <coughs> you could, of course, start off by saying, well, what about the square root? One thing we need is that the number be divisible by the square root, the ceiling of the square root of n. And that's easy to check. The theorem one is that that's true if and only if the number is what's called a quarter square, um, namely a number of the form um, floor of n over t floor of k over two times ceiling of k over two. That's equals two six two o the quarter squares, and you prove that just by looking at it and you say, well, suppose the ceiling of the square root of n is n plus one. So that means we're just a little bit, n is just a little bit um, above m squared plus, it's just a little bit above m squared, and it's no more than m plus 1 squared. It's in the range m squared plus 1 to um, m plus 1 squared. So say it's of the form m squared plus 1 plus i, and then i is somewhere between 0 and 2m. And then you look at all the possibilities for that to be divisible by um, by m plus 1, the c length of That's the definition of the, of the numbers. And that can only happen if um, i is such that um, we, we get a, the, the smallest possibility for m squared plus 1 plus 1 plus i to be divisible by m plus 1 <coughs> is when i is m minus 1, and we get m times m plus 1. Or the only other possibility is that i is 2m, and we get m plus 1 squared. So there are only two, two possibilities for this, and these are the quarter squares. Um, so this is a triviality, uh, but it suggests it's a necessary condition on the numbers with the property we want. And uh, just as a check, you check that this big number is of that form. So quarter <laughs> square is the, um, the floor of... One nine five five times times the scene of that. Well, all right. What about the cube root? So, if we want the cube root, the ceiling of the cube root of n to divide n, then we get a similar condition. It has to be of this form for some, and uh, you check that in fact, yes, indeed, nine 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 zero 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 is of that form, and that gives you an infinite sequence. If you put the two conditions together, if you require that it be divisible both by the uh, ceiling of the square, square root and the ceiling of the cube root, 
you get a smaller sequence, still infinite. And maybe if you continue this process, adding more and more conditions, you could eventually show that the sequence peters out, that it's only a finite sequence. I didn't try it. I'm here to give you nice problems to try to make you rich. <laughs> These are very good candidates for the Reardon Prize. Um, oh, sorry, that's my, my version. Uh, so, that's a nice number. Nine six times followed by zero six times. So, let me ask you, what's the biggest prime that you happen to know explicitly? Does anyone know a big prime that they can actually write down? I mean, you can write down the sem primes if you happen to remember the exponent. You know this is for pi. You can yeah, write the, first, cool. the first 37 digits of pi is a about okay. 10 to the 37, and then it's a prime. But so you know some people, people, I don't know, but some no. people, some people memorize the poems right. for the digits of pi. Does anyone know any bigger primes? Eight, six, seven, five, seven, seven, five, yes, you can't write it down. <laughs> <laughs> That's a prime. What? That's a prime. That's a prime, That's prime yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> What's that? What's that? 8675309. 8675309. That's very good. All right. Well, but, it, but here is a bigger one. In case you, in case you ever need a 20 digit prime, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 is a prime. And um, you might say, well, really? What's remarkable about that? Well, first of all, it's easy to remember. It's got 20 digits. And um, you can say, what about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1? But that's a square. Just as 1, 2, 1 is a square, 11 squared. 1, 2, 3, 2, 1 is 1, 1, 1 squared. <laughs> and they're all squares up to 9. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 8, 7, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 is a square of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 nine times. But when you get to ten, you get a prime. And the next time you get a prime, according to Shyam Gupta, is at 2446. Um, that's only a, a probable prime at the present time. The next one. So we only have two terms, so this is not yet a sequence in the OEIS. It's too short. However, if you look at it in a different way and say, for, what, for which bases is the number 1, 2, 3 up to b minus 1, b, b minus 1 down to 1, in base b. What um, bases is that base b-ish number a prime? And the answer is, well, it is for b equals 10 in red here. That's this number. And it is for 2, 3, 4. For 2, you get 1, 1, nor 1. You get 13. So, um, and the biggest one, was recently found by David Broadhurst. It's only a probable, probable prime, the base 8840, which is quite a large prime indeed. Pseudo prime. I mean, probable prime. Um, so, the next little section is about Alex Myberg's sequence. He is author was when he sent it in, which was just the other day, a high school student in California, I believe. And here's his sequence. So, in order to define it, let me find some chalk. And I'll do it on the board. So, um, so I want to define a function, m of m. It's a function of, of numbers. So suppose n is 57, which you can see. So 57 is 56 plus 1. 7 eighths, I write it in binary. 7, seven eighths plus 1. So the, thank you. the binary expansion is 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. Now we look at this, and what do we see? We can see a 0. We can see a 1. We can see a 2. We can see a 3. We can see a 4, 1, 0, 0, but we don't see 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 is missing. 5 is missing. So m of 57 is 5. You look for the smallest number 
that's missing from binary. So, um, so that, that number could be zero if it's... It could be zero, absolutely. So f m of 15 is zero. Um, so, and I, I want to avoid that. So I define m prime of n to be the smallest positive missing number. So m prime of 15 would be uh, one naught is missing, so it would be two. So here's the sequence. Start off with one, and every time add the smallest missing number. So um, we start off with one. Um, zero is missing, but one is present, two is missing, so we add two. Two, two. This misses two, so we add it, and we get three. Three is one, one. Uh, there's a one, but we don't see one zero, so, so uh, two is missing, so we add two and we get five. Five, one, 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 we have zero, one, two, but we don't have three, so three is missing, so we add it and we get eight. That's the sequence. And um, the question is, how fast does it grow? Seems to be n log n. There's a graph of it shown here, a scatter plot, which goes up to 20,000 terms. And you can see it's pretty flat. So n log n, order n log n, looks like it's the right order. But we don't have any proof. So what I was trying to do, in order to understand this better, was to look at what, take a probabilistic approach and do some experiment. What if you say that after a while, these numbers are pretty random looking. They're big, big numbers, and uh, there's no particular reason to think that the binary version has any particular structure to it. So what if it was just a random number? What would you expect to be the smallest missing number? So here's a little table of all the binary numbers of length 4, uh, from 0 to 15, and here is the function x and m of x, the smallest missing number. So for instance, uh, for 6, which is 0, 1, 1, 0, we see a, a 0, 1, 2, 3, but we don't see a 4, so the smallest missing number is a 4. So we make a histogram of these, and we make a little table. So this table shows the statistics of the smallest missing number um, for binary sequences of length up through 7, um, and where k is the smallest missing number. So there are three numbers where the smallest missing number is two. There are um, three twos in this column. So what is this? If we understood this, we might have a chance of, of having a good heuristic estimate for what happens to my work sequence. Well, so you get a triangle of numbers. There are several things you could ask about this. What are the columns, for example? And you can look them up in the OEIS. And you'll find the first four or five columns. These are the, the first two are trivial. The first three are trivial. The next couple um, are all classic sequences. Not particularly interesting, unfortunately. The next three you'll find in the OEIS, but the only reference is to this table. We don't have any independent. And we have comments saying it would be nice to have an explanation, another explanation for this, these sequences, another opportunity to win the Reardon Prize. Are the columns pretty numbers? No, uh, are the beginnings are. Oh. They are at the beginning, yeah. yeah, but not... Yes, they are. We, we were talking about that at lunch. They yeah. are the degenerating functions, um, but the trouble is the, the numerator and denominator polynomials in the generating function yeah. get bigger and bigger yeah. and nastier and nastier. Yeah, to begin with, they look a bit Fibonacci-ish, but then they, uh, they get mysterious. So we don't understand this triangle. It's not really a triangle either. We don't understand how far it goes. So sequence 261017 tells you the maximum k that you can get, the maximum biggest missing number. I don't even know how to get big values of k. This must be a classical combinatorial question. Write down a sequence of zeros and ones where, where you get almost all subsequences up to a certain point. And then, if we did understand this better, we could then look at the average. Because, so, this 
6, for instance, means that with probability 6 over 16, the k value is going to be 3. So that tells us the probability for a random sequence for missing the smallest missing number is 3. So if we understood that, we could work out the sum, the weighted, you know, weighted sum of, of k times n of times t of nk, the weighted average of the rows of that triangle. Well, we have a lot of data. Um, Hiroaki Yamanuchi worked out the first 58 rows of that triangle. So we have a lot of data. So we know, that, so this sum, we know 58 terms. What is it? Well, it seems to be about 2 to the n times n over 4 plus 4.3, very roughly. We would like to have a better analysis of all of these <coughs> sequences. Um, oh, yes, so speaking about digits, um, here's another sequence. This is. I'm sorry, there's a missing slide here that, ch that says I'm now changing the subject. <laughs> this, I have a lovely title for this missing slide, um, which is, let me just find it here. The smallest prime beginning with the digits of the previous prime. <laughs> Smallest prime digits of the previous prime. What that means, it's almost that it begins with the digits of the previous prime, except you drop the first digit. <laughs> so they're digits, not digits. And the way it goes is like this. It starts off 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. And the rule doesn't really take effect until we get to 11. 11, we look at this, and we Look at its digits. Its digits, we do. Its digits are 1, 1. We drop the first one, so we get 1. We want the smallest prime that hasn't appeared that begins with 1. So that's 13. Uh, we look at this and we drop the leading digit, and so its digits are 3. And we want the smallest prime beginning with 3 that hasn't yet appeared, and that's 31. And then we get um, 17, we get 71, we get 19. Uh, we get 97, we've got um, 71, we don't have 73, so we've got, now got to have something beginning with 3, so we get um, 37, and then uh, we need another 7, so 79, ah oh, yes, and then we get 901, 907, and so on. So that's the sequence. So people often say to me, isn't there a danger that you'll run out of sequences? <laughs> well, no, this, this, one, this one was missing. Now the interesting question is, <laughs> I think it's interesting. What about 23? So you don't see 23. 23 didn't appear. And it seems it's unlikely to appear. It seem, in fact, it seems obvious it's not going to appear. How could we ever get 23? Well, we could if we had a prime that began, say, 7, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 23. You drop off the 7, and then you'd need a prime that began with 23. And that's allowed. So at the beginning here, um, uh, you, you drop any zeros after, the, after you drop the initial digit. So we ha if we ever saw a prime that was 7 followed by lots of zeros and ending 2, 3, the next term will be 23. It seems that, that will never happen. But if you look, this is a log plot 
of the first 400 terms. And this is taking off. This sequence, once we get going, 